And the next day, watch news, it was different again. I, I really do appreciate your, your flexibility, your, uh, your understanding during these times, because things are constantly changing. I wanted to just take a minute before we dive into the message to read a passage to you. You know, Paul in the book of Galatians is addressing folks who are dealing with kind of a, a binding to the law of Moses. And, and this is what he says. I, I, the solution to me here is more what I'm looking at than the problem that they were facing. Our problem is a little bit different. You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. For the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. If you might devour each other, watch out, or you will be destroyed by each other. So I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other. So that you are not to do whatever you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. In, in these days of, of uncertainty and, and changing fluid situations, we're trying to balance and, and work within the parameters of several different virtues. We want to love one another. Top tier priority. We want to love one another. We want to be wise. And we want to, to have faith. These, I think, should be at the forefront of all of our considerations right now. Not live in fear. God has not given us a spirit of fear. Perfect love casts out fear. We want to withdraw from fear and instead live with love and with wisdom. I think one of the important considerations here, one of the important things that's occurred to me as we're thinking about this is that love is going to look different in different people's circumstances. One person shows love today by being here, as I'm saying, you know, I, I want to, to be an encouragement to the people around me. Another person shows love by saying, I'm going to stay home because, because I'm not sure about the people that I've been around and I want to make sure that I'm not doing something harmful to those people that I love. Both of these people are showing love both of them are following the leading of the Holy Spirit. So I just want to encourage you this morning. I want to encourage you. During these times of trouble, in fluid situations, and a great deal of fear, pray. Pray a lot. Pray for the people who are affected. I so much appreciated Norm and Dorothy's prayer this morning. Pray for those who are infected. Pray for those who are, who are in fear. Pray for those whose circumstances are uncertain. Continue to pray. Pray for yourself. Pray for your family. If we live our lives bathed in prayer, we're much more likely to exercise love. We're much more likely to exercise the wisdom of God. And every time we pray, we're exercising faith. Let's talk about the message. The message this morning is going to come as a bit of a, I don't know, maybe it's a funny thing. I, I'm not sure how you'll respond to it. Over the course of the first months that I've been here, I've tried to stay ahead of things a little bit by planning the series that I'm preaching and talking, you know, make sure that I'm, I'm covering things in a certain way. So the message this week has actually been planned for quite a number of weeks. The topic, I, I don't prepare the message itself that far in advance, but I do plan the topic and make sure I'm not backtracking and, and saying the same thing every week because that would just bore all of us. So the messages that I've been preaching these weeks leading up to Easter are a continuation of, we've been talking about who am I? What does it mean to be human? And and early in the year, we looked at what it means to be purely human. What is, the, what is the created order? What was the intended thing that God was trying to do when he created human beings? And we thought about the fall. What happened? God created us to be these good, even in, in 
It's hard for us to say it. It's hard for me to say it. He, he intended for us to be perfect beings. And, you know, we just, all we have to do is get up in the morning and, and smell our own breath, and we know we're not. And, and so, what happened? And so we talked about the fall. But for these weeks, during the Lenten season leading up to Easter, we're talking, we're shifting gears a little bit and talking about who is Christ. If we're Christians, we worship and follow Christ. We, we seek to have his image recreated in us. An examination of our own identity, especially as Christians, can never be complete without an examination of Jesus' identity. And over the weeks, you'll notice that we're looking at some obvious characteristics of who Jesus is. God in the flesh, the miracle worker, the healer, the teacher, the friend, the perfect sacrifice, the risen king. So today, and, and again, I, I laughed. We're going to be talking about Jesus the healer. I think it's an important aspect of his character that we pay attention to this week. But beyond that, the Holy Spirit knew weeks ago what was going to be happening, and I didn't. But this is what this is what was planned. The passage that we're looking at this morning, Matthew chapter 20, verses 29 to 34, speaks of a Christ of compassion. In our modern age, we're skeptical and, and seldom expect Jesus to heal anybody when he's asked. In this way, we're a lot like people that we would criticize for being liberal. But, but these men asked about Jesus' healing. They asked with hope, and they were not disappointed. Matthew chapter 20, beginning with verse 29. As Jesus and his disciples were leaving Jericho, a large crowd followed him. Two blind men were sitting by the roadside. And when they heard that Jesus was going by, they shouted, Lord, son of David, have mercy on us. The crowd rebuked them, told them to be quiet, but they shouted all the louder, Lord, son of David, have mercy on us. Jesus stopped and called them. What do you want me to do for you? Lord, they answered. We want our sight. Jesus had compassion on them and touched their eyes. And immediately they received their sight and followed him. This morning I'd like to try something. Close your eyes. Keep closed. Don't open them until I tell you to open. Don't be. I saw you. No. For the next few minutes, try to put yourself behind the eyes of a blind person. On at least nine separate occasions, Jesus healed one or more blind people. Keep your eyes closed. This particular episode of giving sight is one of the few mentioned in as many as three Gospels. In Mark, Bartimaeus is named as blind man in this episode, but Matthew is the only evangelist to clarify that there were actually two blind men near Jericho. Now, don't go to sleep. Keep your eyes closed. Nine healings. Now, that's, that's a great deal of very specific activity surrounding a single type of disability. At a later time, when Jesus healed a blind man, he declared, the blind man declared that nobody had ever healed a blind man before. The scriptures acknowledge different types of power and different types of prophets, but nobody had ever healed a blind man. Also, in this passage, Jesus is explicitly called Son of David. In, in the Gospels, he's only called that a few times. And this is important because the phrase was associated with Messiah. Not many people would have been willing to shout that Jesus is the Messiah in a crowd. It's also important because in ancient tradition credit Solomon, the first son of David, with having great healing powers. This association of Jesus with a healer communicated quickly what kind of mercy these men wanted. Are your eyes still closed? 
Jesus' followers often didn't understand his mission. When the children wanted to get close, they sent him away. When someone touched his hem and received healing, they downplayed the importance. Now two blind men want to talk to Jesus and, and his followers try to shut these guys up. And it might have been because they perceived that Jesus was in a hurry. It might have been because Jesus was starting to, to have severe problems with the authorities and people shouting that he was the Messiah might draw the wrong kind of attention. It might have been because they were beggars and the followers didn't like that association. Are your eyes still closed? You are unable to see. And you just want what everybody else has. You just want to watch your kids in the traffic. You just want to see the flowers that you smell. You just want to watch where you put your foot. You want to see who you're about to run into. You want to know who's coming without being told. Your eyes still closed? Well, for you, this is very simple. But keep your eyes closed a little longer. What reason could a crowd have for silencing you? You can't see. When someone is present who has demonstrated that he can heal blind people, you can't see. You want to see. And there seems to be no good reason that you should not see by the end of the day. But the crowd is silencing. Keep your eyes closed. Whatever the reason, they wanted these blind men to be quiet, but the blind men would have none of it. They shouted the same thing louder. The essence of their cry has now been handed down for 2,000 years. In more liturgical churches, they call it the cure, and it's repeated in the course of the service. Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. More often, simply, Christ have mercy, or Lord have mercy. It is the cry of the heart that has realized and felt a deep, deep need. The need is so severe that the person has determined that there is nothing else she can do to fill the need. It is only by the mercy of the Son of God that the need will be met. In their case, a need to see. And they quickly named the need when Jesus asked what they wanted. Keep your eyes closed. Mark and Luke clarify this part of the story too. They tell us Jesus not only called the blind men to himself, he involved the crowd. He had the very people who had been trying to silence these blind men, help them reach their goal. The tune changed. They became encouraging in the process. Mark says Bartimaeus leapt up, threw aside his cloak, approached Jesus, and Jesus healed them. He opened their eyes. And you can Mark and Luke clarified that Jesus said faith played an important part. When Jesus touched their eyes, they received their sight. Because of their boldness and their faith and the power of Jesus, they started out blind and ended up seeing. The Bible says Jesus did it for a reason. The healing power of Jesus moved and touched these men in need because of Now, I have known this power. Probably some of you have too, maybe most of you. Sometimes dramatically, sometimes not. I've seen people healed of cancer. I've seen people recover from congestive heart failure when they were expected to die. I've seen people regain mobility. I've seen physical healing of various kinds. Sometimes the sickness was major, sometimes it was minor, sometimes the healing was fast, sometimes it was slow, sometimes it involved medicine, sometimes not, sometimes it was complete, sometimes it was partial, but there have been multiple times that I've seen healing take place when faith, the boldness of prayer, and the power of Christ were essential to the process and could not be denied. In these days of faith healers on TV, some of whom have had character failures to call their faith into question, some of whom have been proven fakes, we want to embrace sometimes our more scientific tendencies. We become, we become 
skeptical and start thinking Jesus doesn't heal today. But he does. We become like the crowd who speaks to the person with a physical ailment, warning them, Jesus, Jesus doesn't heal all the time or in the way we want him to. We acknowledge him as God and diminish his power. In some ways, we become like the people with our eyes closed. We look at Jesus, who is a great leader, a great teacher, a great forgiver, a great debater, and fail to see the great physician, the healer, with great compassion. But I want to encourage you this morning. Pray for healing. Pray for When people try to discourage you or silence you, don't mistake their lack of faith for the measure of Jesus' compassion. We have to be careful not to become like the people of Nazareth. You know, when Jesus ministered in Nazareth, the Bible says he didn't do many miracles there because of their lack of faith. The other danger is just as real, perhaps more sobering. In another place, it says, Jesus began to denounce the towns in which most of his miracles had been performed because they did not repent. It's not a bubble gum machine, I know that. It's not subject to our demands. It's intertwined with a much bigger spiritual context. And I will acknowledge that Jesus doesn't always heal. But in the scriptures, healing was also tied to the faith of the person seeking healing and the boldness to ask. And even those who were not healed did not experience a Christ without compassion. Ask. See. Not. You have not because you ask not. Acknowledge that your need is beyond your power to fill and pray. Jesus Christ Son of David, have mercy on me. And when he doesn't seem to hear you or you become discouraged, say it again. Jesus Christ, Son of David, have mercy on me. I remember Lindsay Robinson, who was the, uh, the conference minister for a long time before his death. He used to say prayers like duck hunting. You don't go duck hunting, shoot once, not get a duck, give up and go home. You keep shooting until you get a duck. Keep praying. Keep praying. His compassion is as real today as it has ever been. Follow the lead of these two blind men. Submit to his will. If he chooses not to heal, submit to his will. But be persistent. Ignore discouragement. Have faith. Ask specifically for what you want. Jesus still has compassion. He can still heal. He still does heal. Be bold and ask. Ask again. Have faith. Then, like these healed blind men, follow him. 